Hello, this is uh, Mark Tooley, president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy, and I am speaking with Jack Jenkins, journalist with uh, Religion News Service, who has an important new uh, book out, uh, whose title, and let's make sure I uh, have it correctly here, called American Prophets. And uh, I have momentarily lost the rest of the title, Jack. So <laughs> I, I got you. Share it with us. It's called Here's American Prophets. You can. Okay. Um, it's called American Prophets, The Religious Roots of Progressive Politics and the Ongoing Fight for the Soul of the Country. So, um, yeah. Very good. And uh, as I was just uh, discussing with Jack, uh, the launch date was inauspicious in that it was uh, 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 timed alongside with the uh, pandemic uh, in March. So uh, hopefully he'll have a, uh, a strong book party sometime this fall in uh, Washington, D.C., and we'll start afresh. But the book, uh, of course, is about uh, the religious left in American politics, culture, and religion uh, currently and uh, historically. And of course, um, the religious right uh, gets uh, so much uh, attention. The religious left uh, too often is uh, under, underplayed and uh, overlooked. So uh, the book is much needed. Uh, it goes without saying that uh, IRD has spent uh, about 40 years reporting about the religious left, uh, often critically. And uh, Jack has a different perspective, but uh, we are agreed about the importance of the religious left. So Jack, uh, thanks so much uh, for joining us. Thank you so much, and I, and, I, and I will commiserate. Your organization has been one of the few who has consistently reported on and acknowledged and you know, just, just noticed the existence of this group, so. Absolutely, and in many ways, and yeah, you know more about this than uh, I do, but uh, the religious left uh, predates the religious right. Uh, yes. In many ways, uh, yes. which is often overlooked. Well, Jack, tell us how you came uh, to write this book and why you think it's uh, so much needed today. So uh, the, the, the short version is I, um, when I was in graduate school and was working as an intern for Religion News Service, um, I ended up getting assigned on contract for RNS to write this story about finding a faith angle in the Occupy Wall Street movement. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll try to unearth that. And so I ran down, I was living in Boston at the time, and I ran down to the Occupy Boston encampment and someone had tipped me off that there was this faith space there. And when I arrived, they were, there, was a, there was a whole tent, an interfaith tent in the Occupy Boston encampment and they were singing hymns. And I came to find out that a lot of seminary students, a lot of divinity school students were involved in that encampment and that a lot of seminary professors and scholars affiliated with faith spaces were coming and speaking at um, that encampment. So I, one of those things is what I found interesting about it is that I was the only reporter um, reporting on this that I knew of. And sometimes for a reporter that can be indicative that you're making a story out of nothing, you know what I mean? Like it can be like a warning. But but I, I kept, the, the deeper I got into it, the more I would kind of after that go and try to report on these gatherings and these protests and these demonstrations where there would be hundreds of people, but there would be one reporter, myself. And that was not always true. Sometimes there would be other journalists who were there, but it kind of became this point of interest for me where in, in addition to covering many other things about religion, there was this one community that seemed to be really amorphous and kind of difficult to pin down that, you know, for lack of a better term, I started referring to as the religious left. And it, um, and so I continued to follow it during my, you know, my, my internship at RNS and then later in progress. And then when I got back to religion news service um, as this point of journalistic inquiry, um, where I just kind of started following these groups. So then after the election of Donald Trump, um, because I've been following a lot of these groups, and to be clear, a lot of the movements I chronicle in the book started under Barack Obama. They didn't start under Trump. But after Donald Trump was elected, there was this explosion of activism in general in progressive circles. And one of the things I kind of wrote about at the time was I was like, it would not surprise me at all if progressive faith activists end up playing a big role in those progressive activist movements, the reason being that they had been doing this stuff for so long. And sure enough, that ended up being the case. And so the book kind of emerged out of this surge of activism that I was watching um, anyway, um, and that I've been reporting on for years that didn't, you know, under Trump became this really, uh, you know, intense version of what I had seen slowly building for several years. And all of that is to say, this community, this group that, again, it's difficult to pin down, they disagree with each other a lot, 
Um, they come from various different faith traditions, often goes unacknowledged by the right and the left. It is often something that happens under the radar. And so I kind of wanted to help expose that. So I think that's the, 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 the short version of where the book came from. Mm -hmm. Now, when I first started writing about the religious left 25 years ago or more, uh, it was much more um, readily identifiable. It was uh, the ecumenical movement, uh, the mainline church agencies. They, they were typically uh, housed in the Methodist building on Capitol Hill. So many of those groups are no longer uh, so relevant today. But the new groups, as you say, are much more uh, amorphous and maybe not quite as easily to identify or describe. But who is the religious left today? And who are the major personalities and the major groups? Yes, and, and th thank you for that question, because as you know, you know, the historic religious left, the one kind of that was originally kind of called, you know, liberal Christianity around the turn of the last century, that was pretty codified and established. It arguably was the genesis of what we now call the progressive movement in general, kind of emerged in that last 20th century, the division between what some people would call fundamentalists and modernists played a role in that, the social gospel movement, et cetera, et cetera. Those lineages of Christianity continued in terms of a theological lineage. But as you note, a lot of those organizations have kind of atrophied in terms of their power. Um, the United Methodist Building still exists. The National Council of Churches still exists. They're still doing things. But compared to where they were, say, in the 1950s, it's not even comparable. What has happened is that there have been these independent movements of faith groups that aren't tied specifically to Christianity per se, or one form of Christianity that have kind of cropped up around issues, right? So one of the big figures that has emerged in the last few years, the last decade in particular, is Reverend William Barber, who kind of got his start in North Carolina in terms of a, a large scale activist by organizing what many called, what came to be called the Moral Mondays movement. And that's important to, to build as a subtext because what the Moral Monday movement was, was a reaction to this um, wave of very conservative lawmakers that were elected into the state legislature and to the governor's mansion in the state of North Carolina. And um, liberals and progressive in that state, you know, felt that they were disproportionately progressive, I mean, sorry, conservative compared to the rest of the state. And so they, this giant outcry began to build against them. And Reverend William Barber helped organize this collective protest that would happen every Monday um, called Moral Mondays, where they would go and demonstrate outside of the North Carolina State House um, and get arrested in mass. And this built every week until it became this very large movement. And in fact, in 2016, which for Democrats, you know, was a, was a series of losses, um, there was one particular bright spot for Democrats in particular, which is that the unseating of that Republican governor in North Carolina, which many analysts attributed, at least in part, if not in full, to the Moral Monday movement that William Barber helped launch. And those were the largest liberal movements, um, lar largest liberal gatherings of 2013, 2014, were the demonstrations he organized. So he has since gone on to take up the mantle of Martin Luther King and kind of reignite uh, what's called the Poor People's Campaign, which is this broader um, economic critique and has been working on that throughout um, Trump's tenure. But you see William Barber on MSNBC all the time. He's now quoted pretty regularly in major outlets like the New York Times or the New Yorker or CNN. Um, so that's somebody who's taken up a lot of space. Similarly, Sister Simone Campbell, who's the head of the um, Catholic Social Justice Lobby Network, which tends to have a more progressive agenda um, you know, than other Catholic lobbyists. She actually, you know, she kind of got her, uh, I write about her in a few different places in the book, but she was involved in the passage of the Affordable Care Act. And she was also um, created this thing called the Nuns on the Bus Tour, which ended up being this, this critique of Paul Ryan's budget, of the Republican budget um, in, you know, 2012, um, 2011 and 2012, where she toured around the country and like kind of decried that budget. And she ended up speaking at the 2012 Democratic National Convention. And no, William Barber actually spoke in the 2016 Democratic National Convention as well. And then, you know, there's a bunch of other leaders. Uh, Linda Sarsour, who um, it was one of the four co-chairs of the Women's March. Um, she actually identifies as a religious left activist. So a lot of the people I profile in the book actually dispute the term religious left, but she identifies as such. Um, and it's proven to be controversial even um, in some progressive circles, but she was a very um, effective organizer and has proven to still you know, have a clout with a lot of different progressives in kind of an interfaith space and a Muslim affairs advocacy space. And then below, below some of those big names I just mentioned, um, other than in, in LGBTQ rights space, there's definitely Jean Robinson, the first openly gay bishop of the Episcopal Church, 
But what you kind of find is that a lot of these movements, the, once you get past those big figureheads, which then even some, only some people are going to know, a lot of them are individual like uh, organizations or, or you know, uh, activist groups. So for instance, one of the movements that I chronicle in the book is the New Sanctuary Movement, which is this effort to kind of for, um, protect undocumented immigrants from deportation. That's the disposition of the activists. And they will you know, house an immigrant in their sanctuaries or in their synagogues um, and try to basically stave off a deportation order from the federal government. There's no one singular figure in that movement that leads it, but the New Sanctuary Movement became so um, popular among faith groups from across the religious spectrum, and actually across the political spectrum too. There are actually some deeply conservative, both theologically and politically, um, uh, communities that are attached to that movement in one way or another. Um, but that movement has, has ended up, be became really influential after Trump was elected. It only expanded after that. Um, et cetera, et cetera. And so you see a lot of activists where they're kind of happening more on the ground. And similarly, in the environmentalism movement, um, Native American and indigenous activists have proven to be really um, you know, able to grab the national attention in, in things like Standing Rock, those protests. And again, there's no one central figure, but the movements catch attention. So I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. And so how does the religious left uh differ from the religious right obviously on issues we know what the distinctions are but organizationally and uh, their demographics and why does one get so much more attention than the other so this is this is a key question i think it gets to something that i'm trying to explore in the book the religious right um you know was built over the course of decades and turns out to be really effective in two places and that is one in the courts they've proven to be pretty um, uh, talented and adept at winning some court battles and, and helping get conservative judges put into positions of power, as well as at the ballot box. I mean, depending on how you define it and which study you use, the religious right or conservative Christians that may be aligned with the religious right tend to vote disproportionate to their, um, in terms of they show up bigger on election day than they do in the general population, which is a very effective form of organizing. And since that, that organ, um, that lattice work, that structure of the religious right was developed over the course of decades. By the time you got to the 70s, 80s, and 90s in particular, their voice was very strong and arguably was one of the reasons that George W. Bush was elected. Um, a lot of the agenda items they put forward were taken very seriously and they kind of won the, the public argument in that um, regard in a big way when it came to understanding faith in the public sphere. But whereas the religious right, now this is a, this is a gross overgeneralization, but it, you know, generally speaking is less racially and theologically diverse than you would find in the religious left. The religious left has people from multiple faiths from across the spe uh, religious spectrum, um, more represented than you would find within the religious right. You know, there's ample numbers of um, progressive Jewish organizations, for instance, and Muslim American organizations, for instance, Sikh organizations and various progressive Christian organizations that all have to kind of finagle and, and navigate you know, their differences, both theologically and also politically, to, to forge campaigns. What that has meant in practice is that instead of um, at the ballot box and in the courts, the religious left has proven to be very effective in the art of protest and demonstration, which is its own form of power. It's able to help stop or push legislation through, for instance, or build a collective movement that's able to, you know, um, push such an outcry that it might impact an election. And so that's where they really shine. That's where, you know, they, they often harken back to the civil rights movement. Um, activists in the modern religious left see that as their progenitor, as like, you know, the mid 20th century religious left, and they try to replicate that. But that also means that there's no often firm structure for the religious left. It, it, there have been various efforts and there are organizations that try to pull together some element of structure, structure like faith in public life, for instance. But a lot of times those structures are ephemeral. They will last for an election cycle or during a legislative battle and then evaporate after that. Um, one of the, the first chapter of my book, I kind of chronicle how the religious left played a key role in the passage of the Affordable Care Act. And one of the things I noticed is that, um, I note in the book is that, you know, that effort really kind of began around 2004, 2005. And then with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, you know, 2009, 2010, that was about eight-ish years where that was um, all occurring. And then after the Affordable Care Act got passed, several of the organizations I know disappear. <laughs> and, um, and so there's kind of this element to where they, they show up for specific causes. Now, I will note 
there are parts of the religious left that have proven to be politically powerful on election day. African-American Protestants in particular are arguably why Joe Biden is um, you know, the, the presumptive Democratic nominee right now. They are also a big reason why Doug Jones is the first Democratic senator from Alabama in quite some time. Um, because Roy Moore, his opponent, Republican, Republican opponent, opponent, had a lot of problems as a candidate. But when it came to election day, the turnout among African-American Protestants was very high there. And so there have, and in, also in Michigan, uh, Muslim Americans who live outside of Detroit and kind of Dearborn, Michigan, they've proven to be an important constituency for candidates to court, either at state level races or at national level races. But generally speaking, there's a reason I call the book American Prophets, which is that, you know, that tradition of, of shouting at power, of decrying um, what they see to be injustice in political systems. That's where the religious left has proven to be most effective and powerful, at least in the last 10 to 20 years. Hmm. Now, uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, the evangelical left, um, much of which perhaps tries to be more uh, traditional theologically and on moral issues, but progressive on uh, economic and environmental issues. Uh, are they a rising force and uh, what part do they play in the wider coalition? So this is an interesting question, and I talk about them in one of the chapters. I have a chapter kind of discussing the religious right in general and this more progressive liberal strain of evangelicalism does come up. And you know, it's, in some ways they've existed for quite some time, right? As you noticed in the 90s, um, there was a, more, a stronger, more codified religious left voice in the more traditional sense around someone like Jim Wallace, right? Where he took up a lot of, of space as a voice of this movement, identifying as an evangelical, um, but also you know, more his, with policy positions that leaned more heavily towards the Democratic Party. Um, and so that kind of, you know, position and strain of evangelicalism is in some ways like very well trodden. You know, you have people today like Shane Claiborne, um, who are, you know, helping gather people near Lynchburg, uh, near um, uh, Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia to hold um, protests um, that doubled as revivals against Jerry Falwell Jr. and that institution for, they, they, are, they argued, because of his closeness to Trump. And that tradition is very well trodden. But the question of whether or not it's growing is a, is a big one because, you know, while they have been very vocal for some time and while younger evangelicals tend to have a different disposition mm -hmm. than older evangelicals, there's an open question as to whether or not those, if there's a younger evangelical who becomes disenchanted with the theology of which they are raised, or um, if it's more conservative or the politics attached to the theology, whether they become a progressive evangelical or if they end up sitting in the back of Episcopal churches. Right, like that, that's a question that is not, it's clear um, for a lot of activists. Moreover, there is now this new phenomenon under Trump where you have a lot of people who might have, you know, as, as recently as four or five years ago, been classified as, as parts of the religious right who were deeply critical of Donald Trump and very much opposed his election. People like Russell Moore, you know, who helps run um, the political arm of the Southern Baptist Convention, who was deeply critical of Trump throughout the 2016 election. Now, whether those people would show up to a Shane Claiborne uh, event, like you know, a protest, that strikes me as highly unlikely. So that group isn't necessarily getting more people. The, the progressive evangelical strain isn't necessarily getting more people from some disaffected people who are disaffected by Trump, who are also evangelical. And it's an open question for me in terms of whether or not that Shane Claiborne wing is continuing to grow or if they're just being able to occupy more space in public in the public sphere that they've been trying to get for quite some time because trump from their perspective has made it relatively easy for them so that's kind of the um i know it's kind of a not answer but it's kind of the one i, I i've been struggling with because i don't know whether or not the progressive evangelical wing is getting more people or if the people who might otherwise you know side with them it just end up becoming mainliners or religiously unaffiliated Maybe your next book. <laughs> yeah. Well, and uh, finally, if you don't mind my getting a little bit uh, personal with you, I know you attended uh, Harvard Divinity School with my uh, young colleague, uh, John Lon Paris, but uh, that's right. You're, you're not ordained uh, to my knowledge, I'm but not. Uh, your uh, work with the Religion News Service and in journalism, and specifically in writing this book, uh, how has that affected your own uh, spirituality, if at all? For the record, I appreciate this question and thank you. And please tell John I said hi. Um, I and I did, for the record, when I originally went to Divinity School. I the plan was to get ordained, but I've just been taking the scenic route ever since. <laughs> um, 
and I'm Presbyterian. I was raised Presbyterian Church USA, went to a college that's called Presbyterian College that's affiliated with uh, the PCUSA. Um, I, uh, you know, one of the things about journalism is, you know, I kind of see it as, as you know, it, it, I don't talk about this quite often, but I do see it as bearing witness, right? I do go to places and I'm tasked with telling the truth. And, you know, I'm not of the disposition that journalists don't have opinions, don't have humanity, don't have you know, those sorts of things. I think the great challenge of journalism is recognizing those things about yourself and then trying and you know, striving to tell a fair and honest story anyway. Um, that to me is, is, you know, is, is arguably more ethical than just trying to pretend that you don't, that you're an automaton that doesn't engage um, in the world. And I say that because, you know, one of the crazy things about being a religion reporter is that it touches everything in humanity, right? You know this, faith impacts politics, culture, um, you know, sports, uh, anything you can name, faith inevitably has some sort of impact on. And what that has meant is that I've gotten the, the, the great privilege of going all over the country and the world to be able to see how faith impacts people's lives. But that means I kind of get the full scope of humanity when I do it. So that means I see, I get to report on things like, you know, abuse scandals in the Catholic Church or the Southern Baptist Convention or even in mainline traditions, like horrific things that humanity has done under the banner of faith. I mean, that faith is not immune to those, um, to those realities. And in fact, if, if anything, it, it, it can often make it worse if it's used to justify those sorts of realities. However, but then I'll have these other, in the same week of reporting on some of the worst things that humanity can do and people using I mean, religion to justify it, I will go and find people who are trying to care for the poor, right? Who are trying to care for folks who've been beleaguered by society and irrespective of whether they're political, they're conservative or liberal, um, or you know what their faith is, they're they're invoking their faith as a reason to stand with you know in my tradition we would call the least of these, and it it gives you a little whiplash on a right on a weekly basis where you're able to kind of see um, the the great actualization of people in their faith and also kind of the darkness the sin that we live within. I mean you know I I basically have a firm what, what's the the adage you know the total depravity is the only theological disposition for which there's empirical evidence. Mm -hmm. And so I have that affirmed on a regular basis, but I also have affirmed this great hope um, that, that, that people of faith uh, continue to serve others. And, and so it, it is simultaneously maybe more cynical and more hopeful about God's creation um, as a reporter because I'm able to witness both at the same time. And so, um, and, and also, you know, irrespective of political or religious tradition, there is something amazing about being able to witness um, human beings invoke their faith to try to make the society better from their perspective. Um, there is something deeply inspiring about seeing someone put it all on the line to try to make a better world for each other and for their children um, because their God or gods compel them to. So uh, th there's no way to not be unaffected by that. Um, so, so that's, that's a, that's a, it's a broad way of saying it, um, but that, that I feel like I've gotten to look at, at, at deeper corners of God's creation than I otherwise would, but I'm, I consider it a blessing to do what I do. Jack Jenkins, author of American Prophets, thank you for a very enjoyable conversation, and we'll hope to see you, uh, when normalcy returns, hopefully you can visit the <laughs> IOD office uh, yes. when those days are here. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jack. Take care.